Uh, good morning and welcome again to the Consumer Protection Forum, Fighting Fraud and Scams During uh, the Pandemic. I'm Gus Bilirakis, as I said, and I represent Florida's Congressional District, which consists of all of Pasco County, uh, portion of Pinellas County and a portion of Hillsborough County. In addition to serving on the Energy and Commerce Committee, as well as the Healthcare Subcommittee, which I'm very active in, and also the Communications and Technology Subcommittees. I'm the lead Republican, as I said, as the ranking member on the Consumer Protection and Commerce Subcommittee. In this capacity, we work in a bipartisan manner to promote innovation, champion emerging technologies, and protect consumers. I appreciate you taking the time to learn more about how to protect yourself and your loved ones from the newest scams. I know we're going to get uh, some helpful information today from our expert panelists. I'm looking forward to that. I'd like to thank our group of panelists from uh, federal and state agencies for the work they are doing to educate the public and hold those who prey upon vulnerable populations accountable. We all look forward to learning from you today. So thank you again. Today, again, we will explore steps we can take to advance our fight against fraud and scams, which is so important, especially during this pandemic. Uh, millions of Americans have been forced to isolate, unfortunately, and remain in their homes, but safety's first. And uh, bad actors, unfortunately, continue to exploit consumers uh, their fears and confusion. Uh, and we all, uh, you know, this is new technology and they exploit this, unfortunately. So the more we learn, the better. Uh, some, again, some promising fake reservations for coronavirus vaccines. We've seen, seen this in our district uh, where they're taking advantage of our seniors. Uh, stimulus checks, fake stimulus checks and loans from small businesses struggling to stay afloat. Again, fraud is taking place right here in the 12th Congressional District throughout the Tampa Bay area, as a matter of fact. We must continue to protect consumers from falling victims uh, to scams as it's not only crippling, it cripples individual finance, individuals financially, but can also cause serious mental health issues and lead unfortunately to suicide. Unfortunately, scammers are continuing to find new ways to exploit vulnerable Americans during COVID-19. With people remaining locked in their homes, many have locked online for social interaction, and that's understandable. The bad guys, however, know this, and the FTC has already found that people are increasingly falling victim to scams through social media platforms. In just the first six months, of 2020, for example, scams originating from social media tripled, resulting in $117 million in losses. With more consumers tuning in to these platforms, scammers create fake profiles offering connection, friendship, or economic relief only to steal information and hard earned dollars. These scams will often come by way of friend requests and direct messages or advertisements. As the FTC continues to publish helpful information on best practices, I urge big tech platforms, and we're gonna have a hearing on this on March 25th. We need big tech, tech platforms to do better. They should help users remain vigilant against scams and fraud. It's their responsibility, in my opinion. Engaging big tech platforms to take a great role in protecting the public will be a focus of our subcommittee this year. The best preventative measures is education, of course, and entities across the country, they're working in unison to share educational materials. Now, big tech, example of a big tech flat platform and I know you'll get into this, uh, is, is Facebook, of course, uh, and, and some of these other platforms, Google, uh, I can go on and on. Uh, so that's why we are here today. Amazon is also a big tech platform. Uh, if consumers know 
what to look for. They will be better equipped to avoid scams. Without further ado, we will kick off our program. I don't want to talk too much. After brief presentations from our presenters, we will address questions from the audience. You can type your question in the chat box at any time during this call, and we will get to it as soon as possible during our question and answer session. Now, uh, I do want Summer, I want to make sure that everyone, if they don't get their question answered, that they will get to ultimately get their question answered. And then, and then those that will be listening to this form or watching this form uh, on a platform, uh, whether, you know, Facebook, what have you, um, I, I want to make sure that, that their questions are, they, they can get a hold of us. So you may want to give them some information on how to get a hold of us so that we can continue to answer the questions. And they may have suggestions too, great suggestions. Uh, the best ideas, in my opinion, come from the people. So our first item is a brief message from Florida's Attorney General, Ashley Moody, and I believe she's doing a great job. So uh, without further ado, we'll turn to Ashley Moody. So much, and it's provided more ways for scammers to execute their devious schemes. Here are some basic tips to help you better protect your finances and sensitive information in the age of COVID-19. Seek information from trusted sources, such as county health departments or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Avoid too good to be true offers or promotions. Verify sources of solicitations and avoid responding directly to unsolicited emails, text messages, and phone calls. And finally, pay with a credit card if you can, especially online, as credit card companies often provide extra consumer protection measures. These are just a few tips to stay safe this Consumer Protection Week and beyond. For more resources, visit Scams at a Glance at our webpage, myfloridalegal.com slash scams at a glance. If you do fall victim to a scam or see something suspicious, report it to my office by calling 1-866-9-NO-SCAM or visiting myfloridalegal.com. By developing smart consumer habits and alerting my office to scams, you can help us build a stronger, safer Florida. Next, we will move into a presentation uh, from Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Ms. Lisa Weintraub Schifferly. She's with the Office of Older Americans. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today to talk about coronavirus scams and financial protection during the pandemic. My name is Lisa Schifferly, and I'm a senior policy analyst in the Office for Older Americans at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And at the CFPB, we are committed to providing up-to-date information and resources to help you protect and manage your finances during this difficult time. I'm gonna share some of those resources with you today. I think there's a PowerPoint. Um, if you all can pull that up, please. Great, so we can go ahead to the next slide now. Thank you. So one of our main resources is consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus. And on this site, the CFPB has put together all of our COVID related resources. The resources are available in English and Spanish as well as several other languages mentioned on the slide. And the site includes information about scams like vaccine scams and government imposters that you heard about on the attorney general's video and that the FTC is going to talk to you about more in a few minutes. This site also includes some of the financial protection issues that I'm going to discuss, like what to do if you're having trouble paying your mortgage or your rent, how to prioritize bills, and tips about managing your credit and debt during the pandemic. On the next slide, you'll see a site that we've created, consumerfinance.gov slash housing. This is to help people who are struggling with paying their mortgage or rent. We launched this site 
as an interagency housing website with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, as well as the Federal Home Finance Agency. And it's basically a one-stop shop for anyone who needs to find accurate information about housing relief options available during the pandemic. I'll tell you a little bit about what you'll find there on that housing website. On the next slide, you'll see some information about avoiding mortgage relief scams. And the most important thing to remember if you're looking for help with your mortgage during the pandemic is never pay someone upfront if they say they're gonna stop your foreclosure. Paying upfront is a red flag for a mortgage relief scam and it is illegal for them to charge you upfront. Some other red flags to look out for are if the company guarantees it will get the terms of your mortgage changed or if they guarantee that you won't lose your home. Also, if they tell you to send your payment to someone other than your mortgage company or servicer, or tell you to stop paying your mortgage, those are big red flags. And remember, you can find free help from certified HUD housing counselors. <laughs> and again, you can get more information on that at consumerfinance.gov housing. Also on the next slide, I wanna take make sure you know about a few protections for homeowners with federally backed mortgages. These are special protections um, during the COVID pandemic. And the first is a foreclosure moratoria, which uh, right now, if you have a federally backed mortgage with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, you can't be foreclosed on until the end of March at the earliest. And these deadlines may change based on federal legislation. Um, and if you have another federally backed mortgage, you can't be foreclosed on it until after June 30th. Second, there is a forbearance option for federally backed mortgages. And if you're not sure if your mortgage is federally backed, again, you can go to consumerfinance.gov housing. We have a tool to, that can help you figure that out. But with forbearance, that's when your mortgage servicer or lender allows you to temporarily pay your mortgage at a lower, lower payment or pause paying your mortgage. And with COVID related forbearance, there are no additional fees, penalties or interest. So if you are having trouble paying your mortgage, I encourage you to reach out to your servicer right away so you don't lose that right to the forbearance. And if you're in a forbearance already that's about to end, call your servicer to request an extension as soon as possible. You can now extend for up to 15 to 18 months depending on the type of mortgage that you have. And even if you don't have a federally backed mortgage, you should contact your servicer if you're having trouble paying the mortgage. And you can get all the details about the dates and deadlines at consumerfinance.gov housing. But I did wanna preview that for you. And if you are a renter, there are protections for you there as well under a CDC order. And there's a copy of a um, sheet that you can give to your landlord to show your protections under that CDC order. Now on the next slide, I wanna talk about uh, keeping up with your bills. If you are having trouble paying your mortgage or paying your bills, you are not alone. A lot of people are having trouble right now. The important thing to know is to reach out to your lenders, loan servicers, and other creditors. They can't help you unless you reach out to them. And you should just be prepared to explain some of the things listed here, like your financial and employment situation, how much you can afford to pay, and that you're experiencing financial hardship due to the pandemic. It's also a good time to think about how to deal with that. On the next slide, you'll see some information about knowing your rights related to debt collection. There is a federal law called the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, which says a debt collector is not allowed to use unfair practices to collect a debt. So it prohibits debt collectors from using false and misleading practices. So that means they can't misrepresent the debt, including the amount that you owe, they can't threaten you and they can't call you at all times of the day and night. So just be aware of those rights and you can check out our website for more details on them. Also, if you are looking for help settling your debt and working out a payment plan, uh, be a little wary of debt settlement companies, also sometimes called debt relief companies. They charge you a fee upfront in order to renegotiate your debts. And sometimes if you work with one of them, you may end up deeper in debt than when you started. So. We encourage you to consider working with a nonprofit credit counselor or negotiating, negotiating directly with the creditor or debt collector yourself. Now on the next slide, you'll see some tips for protecting your credit. Uh, this is also really important during the pandemic as everyone's or a lot of people's finances are being affected. Um, it's a good time to get a copy of your credit report. And right now 
due to COVID until April of 2021, you can get free weekly credit reports at annualcreditreport.com. When you get it, you should check it. And if you've entered any sort of payment agreements, make sure that those are properly reflected on your credit report. For example, if your lender agreed to let you skip one month's payment, make sure they didn't report it as delinquent or a missed payment. And if they did, then you can report and dispute inaccurate information first with the credit reporting agency, that's like Equifax, Experian, or TransUnion. And then if that, doesn't, uh, if that doesn't resolve it, then you can uh, report it to the CFPB. And on the last slide, you'll see our information about how to report to the CFPB. You can report at consumerfinance.gov slash complaint. Most companies will respond to complaints within 15 days. And for more information about all the topics that I talked about today, you can visit consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus. We do update that site regularly so you can get the most current information there. So thanks everyone. I look forward to your questions and I hope you stay healthy and safe. Thank you so much, Lisa, that's great information. Next, we'll go ahead and move into a presentation by the Federal Trade Commission, Colleen Tressler. Thank you, Colleen. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Congressman Bilarakis, for organizing this event. I also have a short presentation, if we can pull that up. Great. So as the nation's Consumer Protection Agency, the FTC works to stop unfair, deceptive, or fraudulent practices in the marketplace. We conduct investigations, sue companies and people that break the law, and alert consumers and businesses about scams we're seeing, as well as educate them about their rights. Today, I'd like to talk to you about some of the top frauds and scams of 2020, some of the COVID-related scams we're seeing, and ways you can protect yourself and the people you care about. Next slide, please. In 2020, the FTC took in more than 4.7 million reports. That's up from 3.2 million in 2019. Total fraud losses in 2020 were $3.3 billion, up from 1.9 billion in 2019. In 2020, people filed roughly 1.4 million reports about identity theft, more than double the number in 2019. The biggest surge related to the nationwide dip in employment. After the government expanded unemployment benefits to people left jobless by the pandemic, cyber criminals filed unemployment claims using other people's personal information. In 2020, we had more than 390 4,000 reports about government benefits fraud, overwhelmingly about identity theft involving unemployment benefits. Compare that to 12,900 reports in 2019. People also told us about identity theft involving their federal economic impact payments from the IRS by reporting it as tax identity theft. In 2020, the FTC got more than 89,000 reports of tax identity theft, compared with a little over 27,000 reports in 2019. While many of the reports concerned other types of tax identity theft, the report numbers began to swell when distribution of the impact payments began. Imposter scams, a subset of fraud reports, followed with more than 498,000 reports from consumers in 2020. 22% of those people reported a dollar loss totaling nearly $1.2 billion. These scams include romance scams, people falsely claiming to be the government, a relative in distress, a well-known business or a tech support company, all to get people's money. Online shopping issues rounded out the top three reports in 2020. And while online shopping ranks third in overall reports to the FTC, it ranks number one when it comes to COVID related complaints. And here's why. According to an FTC data spotlight issued in July, more people reported problems with online shopping in April and May of 2020 than in any other months on record. 
and more than half of them said they never got what they ordered. Reports show that early in the pandemic, shady sellers began putting up websites, offering hard to find products like PPE and household cleaners and disinfectants. When customers asked about their orders, scammers said the pandemic was causing shipping delays and then stopped responding. All the while billing people for things that didn't get delivered, wasn't what the customer ordered or was a cheap knockoff. The phone is still the top way that scammers are reaching us, both through phone calls and text messages. In fact, there was a sharp increase in the number of reports saying that scammers contacted them by text message. And not surprisingly, many of these text messages were related to the pandemic. Next slide, please. For the last year, the FTC has been working to identify and alert people to frauds and scams surrounding the pandemic. We created a dedicated website at ftc.gov coronavirus. There you can find information on topics ranging from economic impact payments, health claims, and online shopping issues, to contact tracing, government imposter scams, job scams, misinformation and rumors, and most recently, COVID vaccine scams. With every passing day, the news on COVID-19 vaccine distribution seems to change. One reason is that distribution varies by state and territory and scammers, always at the ready, are taking advantage of the confusion. Besides a big dose of patience, here are some tips to help you avoid a vaccine-related scam, no matter where you live. Contact a trusted source for information. Check with state or local health departments to learn when and how to get the COVID vaccine. You can also talk with your healthcare provider or pharmacist. Don't pay to sign up for the COVID vaccine. Anyone who asks for a payment to put you on a list, make an appointment for you, or reserve a spot in line is a scammer. Next, you can't pay to get early access to the vaccine. That's a scam. On Medicare, you don't have to pay to get the COVID vaccine. Only scammers will ask you to pay. Next. Ignore sale ads for the vaccine. You can't buy it anywhere. It's only available at federal and state approved locations. And finally, nobody legitimate will call, text, or email about the vaccine and ask for your social security, bank account, or credit card number. That's a scam. Next slide, please. Reportfraud.ftc.gov is a new version of the FTC's consumer reporting website. When people see frauds, scams, and other bad business practices, the FTC wants to know about it. We use these reports to investigate, bring law enforcement cases, and alert people about what frauds to be on the lookout for so they can protect themselves, their friends, and family. By following a few short steps, a person's report is instantly available to more than 3,000 federal, state, and local law enforcers across the country. After someone tells us what happens, they get advice on what they can do to recover and how to guard against fraud in the future. And the last slide, please. This is National Consumer Protection Week. The FTC is focusing on ways you can connect with people you care about. Some may be isolated and you can help them fight fraud. So now that you have the facts, we're asking you to share what you know and asking others to do the same. You know, sometimes a friendly call and conversation is all it takes to brighten someone's day, help them feel connected and ease their worry and confusion. I look forward to hearing about your experiences and answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colleen. Next, we have the Florida Division of Consumer Services, Rick Kimsey, and he's the director. Thank you, Rick. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you to Congressman Bill Arrakis and his staff for inviting us to this uh, virtual forum. Um, I think there's a presentation I sent in if you have it. Uh, 
As she said, my name is Rick Kimsey. I'm the Director of Consumer Services at the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Next slide, please. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about the department and some aspects of our consumer protection efforts. Uh, the department is the state's clearinghouse for consumer complaints and protection and dissemination of consumer related material within the state of Florida. Um, AFDEX plays a fairly unique role in the state of Florida in that we assist consumers through direct regulation of certain industries. Uh, we also perform mediation services and refer consumers to the appropriate agencies, uh, whether state or federal, to, to suit their needs. Uh, do you have the next slide, please? Okay. Um, just to give you a, an idea of the scope of what we're, we see at the department, uh, this last year, we received about 300,000 calls at our computer, comp consumer assistance center uh, for direct consumer assistance. Uh, based on those calls, we processed more than 40,000 complaints. And those complaints yielded about $3 million in direct consumer refunds. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to some of the uh, issues covered by other panelists, one uh, aspect of corona fraud that we've been seeing is fraudulent advertisement and uh, uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, so far during the pandemic, uh, states and consumers have purchased about $7 billion worth of PPE. Uh, we continue to see fraud uh, in the areas of face masks, gloves, hand sanitizers, and disinfectants. As previously mentioned, face ma masks and gloves are usually products that just never arrive to consumers. Uh, the department assists these consumers in contacting the sellers and trying to make those uh, finalize those purchases or refund the consumer's money. Uh, with hand sanitizers, we've been seeing uh, hand sanitizers on the market that either are poor quality, uh, do not contain enough ethanol, and in some cases contain harmful chemicals uh, with the rush to get these things on the market. Uh, finally, with disinfectants, the department also warns people to make sure that uh, the disinfectants you're using on the market are registered with US EPA and the, and the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Uh, a few tips when purchasing PPE. Uh, we suggest, as you may have heard before, that you buy from a reputable seller. Uh, lots of companies are popping up online and offering to sell these products to you. Uh, make sure that they have a good online reputation. Uh, do your research. You can go to the department's website and we have a business complaint lookup and you can look at the complaint history of businesses uh, managed by the department as well as other uh, agencies such as the Better Business Bureau. Uh, try to make your online purchases with credit cards because it is easier to get your funds back if uh, you are the victim of a scam. And once again, as it's been said by many people, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And you probably should avoid those type of transactions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as I stated early, earlier, we're the uh, consumer clearinghouse for the state of Florida. And if you feel you, you've been the victim of a scam, or if you're in need of assistance, information on any consumer related issue, you can please contact us and uh, our consumer assistance center will be able to help you. Uh, the numbers of contact are 1-800-HELP-FLA and in Spanish, 1-800-FL-AYUDA. Uh, and all this information, including COVID-related scams that you've heard about from these panels, can be found at floridaconsumerhealth.com. Next slide, please. And finally, if you'd like to keep up to date on emerging trends and scams and fraud, we suggest that you subscribe to our Florida e-consumer newsletter. Uh, each month, we provide consumers with up-to-date information on, on scams and frauds that are happening at the national and local level. And uh, I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. Uh, and I do, we are, the Congressman actually subscribes to the newsletter each month and we share information on our social media uh, from that, that, that newsletter. It is, does have good information. Next we have from the Homeland Security Investigations Tampa office, we have the Assistant Special Agent in Charge, Micah McCombs. Micah, thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, special thanks to Congressman Bill Arrakis, as well as his staff, in particular, um, uh, his district director, Dan Pash, who is a proud alumni of the HSI Citizens Academy. So thank you very much for having me. 
Um, Homeland Security investigations, uh, the running joke uh, is that we're probably one of the largest agencies you've never heard of. And we are the principal investigative agency uh, or arm of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we have over 7,100 special agents assigned to 200 cities um, across the United States. And, and we are located in 53 foreign countries throughout the world working with our foreign counterparts. HSI special agents have a statutory authority to investigate and enforce over 400 federal laws. And within HSI, we have the National Intellectual Property Rights Coordination Center in Virginia. Uh, the IPR Center coordinates investigations of trade fraud and intellectual property violations with the mission to ensure national security by protecting the health and safety of the public, uh, the economy, and our warfighters. And if you've seen a movie recently, uh, which I'm sure we all have, in the beginning credits or the rolling credits, you'll usually see a, a HSI special agent badge right there along with a FBI special agent badge. We take uh, intellectual property rights and consumer protection very seriously. Uh, the IPR Center attacks vulnerabilities in the global supply chain to further secure the border, facilitate legitimate trade, and dismantle criminal organizations engaged in trade crimes. No. The IPR Center has 25 partner agencies to include five international partner agencies being Interpol, Europol, uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police or the RCMP, the City of London Police, and the Mexican Revenue Service, just to name a few. And again, the IPR Center stands at the forefront of the U.S. government's response to combating global intellectual property thrift, theft and enforcement of its international trade laws and serves as the primary government entity for the exchange of information and intelligence related to COVID-19 illicit criminal activity. So during the pandemic, we've learned that transnational criminal organizations around the world are actively seeking to exploit and profit from a wide range of criminal activity. These individuals and organizations quickly adapt and when opportunities present themselves, uh, we've had to adapt quickly as well. In April of 2020, HSI launched Operation Stolen Promise to combat these increasing and evolving threats. Uh, the operation combines HSI's expertise in global trade investigations financial fraud and cyber investigations, along with our private and public partnerships with the intent to disrupt and dismantle this criminal activity and strengthen global supply chain security. Besides IPR infringement, we understand that all COVID-19 related crimes are financial in nature as monetary gain and monetary gain rather is the primary purpose of the criminal efforts and that the majority of these frauds are being perpetrated over the internet. What I'd like to do now is on some following slides, and, and I'd like to make these slides available on, on to the viewing audience so they can review them later. But uh, it's my investigators. Uh, I'm located here in Tampa, Florida, and uh, the HSI Tampa uh, is a bit of a misnomer. It actually covers 58 of the 67 counties in Florida. So basically all of the state with the exception of state Miami and West Palm Beach. And we are seeing a number of scams uh, being perpetrated on a daily basis throughout uh, the Middle District of Florida and the Northern District of Florida uh, U.S. Attorney's Offices. We sit on both the uh, Middle District of Florida and Northern District of Florida U.S. Attorney's Offices uh, COVID-19 uh, Task Force. And so there we're working with our federal partners, a lot of the agencies uh, on the call today, to evaluate those, say, Sentinel complaints and other information coming into the task force and prioritizing and taking action, take, taking action um, on those, those leads. Uh, I, I can tell you that uh, we leave no stone unturned uh, within the task force. Um, my agents are, are investigating crimes globally uh, now affecting consumers right here in the state of Florida. And uh, I think a lot of times consumers think I send off this complaint and what's gonna happen to it? Is anybody listening, right? That's always sort of the fear, um, but they're evaluated, they're looked at. And uh, I can tell you that a single complaint involving a, a complaint about being built out of a shipment of hand sanitizer 
launched a glo- uh, and uncovered rather a global network uh, operating out of Southeast Asia uh, and the multi, multi millions of dollars uh, uh, bilking consumers all throughout the United States. Uh, res- this transnational criminal organization is responsible for hundreds of websites and stolen data and uh, have so far uh, we're approaching or accounting towards $100 million of loss just uh, from this one transnational criminal organization. And you know where that started? It started with one lead in Florida. And that one kind of stuck home for my agents because the, the, the person who um, ordered that hand sanitizer was an immunocompromised individual. And did that transnational criminal organization take that seriously or have any concern uh, that this person wasn't getting what they needed during the pandemic? Like in those early days, we all needed uh, PPE. No, they didn't. So my agents took that personally and uh, they're literally turning over stones all all throughout the world with our partners all throughout the world uh, to bring those folks to justice. So that's just a glimpse into um, you know the the uh, links that uh, you know your middle uh, district, northern district task forces will go through to uh, ensure that consumers are protected. Um, I in the first slide you'll also find uh, my email address. I'm I'm easily reachable. Um, I'm ready to uh, to have a conversation or or give a presentation to any groups that uh, you think would need some uh, further information on our, F- on our efforts to combat uh, uh, consumer fraud. And um, with that, I'll wrap it up and, and take any questions if there are any, but I uh, really appreciate the invitation to be here today. And uh, thank you all for, for um, giving me a listen. Thanks. Thank you so much, Micah. Great information. Um, Next, we'll move to the IRS criminal investigation. We have Tampa Field Office Assistant Special Agent in Charge, Ronald Ronald Locker. Thank you so much for being here, sir. I'll unmute myself. Thank you very much. Uh, Good morning to all. Uh, I'm grateful as well to uh, Congressman Billy Rockus for uh, coordinating this important forum. You know, education is quite simply the most powerful tool we have to prevent fraud and protect consumers. With the tax filing season recently open, the second round of economic impact payments being delivered with a third being discussed in D.C., scammers are looking to cash in. Fraudsters never stop. And today I'm going to caution you about three areas ripe for fraud and increasing focus of the work that we do at IRS Criminal Investigation. Uh, During the pandemic, the IRS has seen a variety of economic impact payment or EIP scams and other COVID-related schemes designed to steal money and personal information from taxpayers. Many of these scams are not new, but have been reformatted by crooks to steal during this time of national crisis. So please be aware of the following. First, text messages asking taxpayers to provide bank account information under the promise of receiving the EIP. Phishing schemes using fake phone calls, text, email, social media, messages asking for personal or financial information. Taxpayers may even receive fake donation requests for individuals, groups, and areas heavily affected by COVID-19. There are also more sophisticated scams offering bogus opportunities to invest in companies developing so-called COVID-19 vaccines or treatments while promising that the company will dramatically increase in value as a result. Criminals are constantly changing their tactics and taxpayers uh, taxpayers can help protect themselves by acting as a first line of defense with some basic tips. You know, generally speaking, I don't answer my phone call or respond to texts from numbers that are not already in my contact list. Someone important that you want to speak with, they'll leave you a message or identify themselves in the text. The IRS will never call threatening you with your arrest or a lawsuit. If you get a similar call, just hang up. If someone contacts you via text message or email or social media claiming to be from the IRS, it's a scam, plain and simple. Do not give your bank account or debit or credit card information, even if someone claims it's necessary to get your economic impact payment. Do not click on links or open attachments from unsolicited emails, even if they claim to have special information about your EIP. You know, a couple other things, make sure your computer is up to date on malware and other protective services. 
And when in doubt, speak with a trusted friend or source before responding to questionable calls, texts, emails, social media, and whatnot. Now warning about uh, the misuse of payroll protection program and the promise to the taxpayers that are here on this call today that we are fighting to ensure the integrity of the program. The Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, better known as the CARES Act, is a federal law enacted in March of 2020 designed to provide emergency financial assistance to millions of Americans suffering the economic effects resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic shutdown. One source of relief is the authorization of potentially forgivable loans to small businesses for, the, for job retention and certain other, uh, other expenses through the Payroll Protection Program. The program allows qualifying small businesses and other organizations to receive potentially forgivable loans if the business spends the proceeds within a set period of time on qualified business expenses, which are primarily for payroll. Unfortunately, some took advantage of the program some obtain loans under false pretenses, uh, pretending to, be, to have more employees on their payroll than they actually had, and others made up businesses entirely. Some rightfully obtained the loans, but then spent the money on boats, cars, houses, and other personal assets or vacations rather than on their company payroll. The last year has been challenging for all of us, but it's no excuse to maliciously take advantage of a program designed to help keep small businesses and families afloat. We wanna give fair warning that the full might of the federal law enforcement is catching up to those who took advantage of the payroll protection program. And if you or someone you know attempted to do so, it is in your best interest to correct your actions before the arm of justice does so for you. You know, we have ongoing criminal investigations of dozens of such scams in Florida, and please do not be one of them. Finally, I want to warn all taxpayers about a fraud we see every year this time of year. As a reminder, U.S. persons are subject to tax on worldwide income from all sources. Most tax taxpayers meet this obligation by reporting all taxable income and paying taxes according to the law. However, those are, there, are, there are a few that are willfully hiding their income and should know that the IRS is gonna be working across all of its divisions the highest, to, to deliver the highest possible compliance. Taxpayers found to be committing fraud may be subject to penalties, including payment of taxes, interest, fines, and when we get involved, jail time. Tax return preparers are vital to the U.S. tax system. Although most tax preparers provide honest and professional services, unfortunately, there is a small number of dishonest preparers who set up shop during the filing season and they steal their clients' money and their financial information. So taxpayers can avoid falling victim to unscrupulous tax preparers by following a few simple steps. Look for a preparer who's available year round, not the fly by the night folks that come in just during the tax season. You can ask your preparer, is he, does he have a P10, an IRS preparer tax identification number, which is required for all paid preparers? You can also inquire about a preparer's credentials and check their qualifications. Do they know more about taxes than you? You can ask about their service fees. Avoid preparers who base fees on a percentage of their client's refund or claim to offer a bigger refund than their competition. If a preparer suggests a tax strategy that sounds questionable, remember the old adage. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. We've heard that a few times already this morning. You should question your preparer who often who offers to take their payment from your refund. The refund should go directly to the taxpayer, not the preparer. Never sign a blank or incomplete tax return. Fully review the return before signing. And remember, even if you use a preparer, you are ultimately responsible for the tax return and the information that's on it. For more information on choosing a tax professional or file a complaint against one, visit irs.gov. Uh, taxpayers who suspect tax violations uh, by a person or business may report it to the IRS using form 3949A. It's called an information referral. We take those uh, on a daily basis. But please ultimately protect yourself. Fraudsters can't steal your money. They can't file false returns in your name and they can't take advantage of you if you don't give them an opening to do so. And as I first stated, education is your best defense and our best weapon in the fight against fraud. So my final plea is this. I commend those of you who are in attendance today for taking the action to learn how you can protect yourself. So please take what you've learned, echo it far and wide, your friends and family. And I really appreciate it. Uh, if I can answer any questions, I would be happy to do so. 
Okay, thank you so much, Ron. And that does conclude our panelist presentations. We do have, again, this is the time for questions and answers. If you have a question, please type it into the chat box um, on Zoom. We have a, a couple of uh, important pieces of information and some questions here that have been submitted. Um, Sherry asked, how can we get a copy of this meeting? Um, once we, we finish concluding recording, this meeting will be placed on the Congressman's website. It will also be sent out to various targeted um, assisted living facilities and nursing homes, um, as well as some senior organizations to be sure that we're, we're sharing this information as widely as possible. Um, so again, you can look at the Congressman's website, www.billarakis.house.gov, a little after this meeting, and it will be posted there for anyone to use the slides or the information. Um, we have from one of our participants today, his name is James. He said, uh, thank you for having this event. He works with the Pinellas County Division of Inspector General, and their goal is to help citizens and employees take a direct role in improving their government. The Clerk's Division of Inspector General Public Integrity Unit has established a hotline for reporting potential fraud waste or abuse of Pinellas County resources. All information received is treated confidentially to the extent allowed by law. And anyone who observes or suspects dishonest or fraudulent activity should notify the hotline immediately. And that hotline is 727-45-FRAUD or 727-45-FRAUD, uh, fraud hotline at PinellasClerk.org. Um, and so we, we thank you for sharing that information and we'll be sure to include that along with our presentation. Um, we do have a, a question here. Um, and the question I believe would be for CFPB. Um, do you anticipate a large number of foreclosures and or evictions once the moratorium expires? How could this impact banks, the renting environment, et cetera? Thank you. So, uh, Yes, thanks for that question. That's an excellent question. And the CFPB is keeping a very close eye on this issue because we are concerned that there may be another wave of foreclosures or evictions once moratoriums expire. Of course, it depends on you know what exactly the pending legislation provides and how much it extends those moratorium or provides other protections for people who are behind on their mortgages or rent. Um, but we are looking very closely at this and making sure that lenders and uh, landlords are treating people friend, uh, treating people fairly um, as protections for mortgages do expire. So we are looking at this. That's why we're putting the most up-to-date information at consumerfinance.gov slash housing. So that's a place to keep checking back as things change to see what the latest protections are and how you can avail yourself of them. And again, if you do experience any problem with your mortgage lender um, or with another bank, we do encourage you to report it to us at consumerfinance.gov slash complaints so that we can investigate. Thank you so much, Lisa. And that does conclude our questions. Again, if you have a question that you weren't able to ask today, please feel free to call our office 727-232-2921 or to email the Congressman directly at his website, billarakis.house.gov. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. We appreciate your time today and, and know that this information will be very useful as we share it throughout our community. Congressman, did you have anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We're gonna do more of these and hopefully we can get back to face-to-face -to -face or maybe hybrid where we can have some uh, folks attend uh, in person, but also, uh, you know, we can do the virtual, but this has been very informative. I want to, uh, I want to ask the panel and they don't have to answer right now, but please get back to me. Uh, what, how can we help? How can the U S Congress help with legislation, uh, to, in order for you to do your job more effectively, or, uh, are there obstacles out there? that need to be removed uh, so that you can do your job more effectively. I mean, obviously, you're probably going to state, some people are going to say funding, which is probably true, but there could be something else as well. Now, if you want to answer that question, fine. Uh, I know we don't have a lot of time. So uh, I know something that also comes up is, uh, you know, when you're on your, uh, your iPhone or your iPad, uh, you know, you become the, you know, you get these notifications. I know I have 
uh, and I had just turned them off, but uh, that you're the mil one millionth customer and you have an opportunity to, uh, to win a prize, a, a big prize, what have you. Uh, I shut it off. Uh, are those calls uh, or those notifications legitimate? Uh, should we shut them off? Are they trying to get your ID? I think that's very important. And I also want to tell the folks that uh, they can contact our office at any time. Now, I know Summer gave the information. She'll probably give it one more time. Uh, you know, our telephone number, 727-232-2921, and then Summer will give the email. Uh, now, would anybody like to respond? I, I also want to touch on the robocalls very briefly uh, on some of the, the action that we've taken in the Congress. Now, being the lead Republican on this uh, subcommittee will be very helpful to my constituents, and we're going to be focusing on this. So we will be in touch with you on a regular basis to get uh, your input. Uh, but Summer, uh, I don't know if anyone on the panel wants to make any uh, last-minute remarks with regard to what I stated, the questions that I asked. If they have, if they don't, then uh, you know maybe they can reply. Uh, after the program. Okay. Um, hi, hearing hearing no um, input, I, we can follow okay. up with them. Um, and then again, our website is billaracas.house.gov. So if anyone wants to email the Congressman a question directly or some suggestions or input, that would be the place to do it. And then let us know uh, you know, I'm speaking to the audience now. Let us know how effective this was, how we can improve it, the communications. Uh, but I will tell you that I thought the, uh, they were excellent presentations from the panel. Uh, just to briefly address the robocalls, uh, you know, this is a big nuisance. Uh, it's kind of scary uh, because a lot of our seniors now are avoiding the telephone calls, but it could be a friendly call from a neighbor uh, or family member, and uh, you know they're avoiding the calls altogether. But uh, I have statistics too. I'm going to avoid that. But in, I will tell you what the Congress has done so far. But we need to do more. Focus on it. And in 2019, Congress passed the Trace Act, uh, and uh, and I helped pass that particular act. This bill gives the FCC the tools it requested to go after the people who are breaking the law and using robocalls and swindle vulnerable, to swindle uh, vulnerable Americans, unacceptable. So you might ask, why are we still being inundated with robocalls if Congress took action almost two years ago? The answer is twofold. First, the entire law is still in the process of being fully implemented. That's how we do things, unfortunately, in Congress. It's too slow. Uh, which isn't expected to be uh, fully implemented till this summer, but we'll stay on that. However, the portions of the TRACE Act that have been implemented have been helpful. In 2020, the FCC reported a 30% decrease in spam calls with billions of calls being blocked. Unfortunately, many are still getting through each day. That's partly because of the shadowly auto dialing industry, which makes good money by unleashing millions of calls a day. We need to go after them. Uh, again, uh, we're doing everything we possibly can. That means we must do more, again, to rid society of this plague. It is a plague. We, we, we have to make it easier to identify and prevent those who wish to prey upon Americans with those robo scams, robocall scams. And this is something uh, my committee will be focusing on this year as well. So again, thank you very much for participating. I hope it was helpful and uh, we're gonna continue to do much more. God bless you, thank you.